So you probably read the title and you're already mad. It's okay. You're on the internet. Everyone is mad all the time. But let me just start by saying that I understand that people mostly like Pokemon Coliseum these days, and that I'm working uphill trying to sell you on an unpopular opinion here. Actually, realistically, most of you have probably never played Coliseum and have no opinions about it one way or the other, and that's okay too. But a lot of the conversations that I've had with other people about this game over the last year have been with people who like the game, and most of them have totally valid reasons for doing so. So let me just extend an olive branch to all of the people that I've pissed off with my tweets about this game. I understand that there are things to like about Pokemon Coliseum. It was the first full 3D Pokemon adventure on the GameCube all the way back in 2003. It's got great character designs, cool locations, and probably the coolest first 20 seconds of a Pokemon game ever. It's one of the only Pokemon games ever to attempt to target a slightly older audience with its slightly darker premise. And also, it has a lot of very popular Johto Pokemon in it, like Espeon, Umbreon, the Johto starters, the legendary Don't call them dogs, don't call them dogs, don't call them dogs, Ferrets, and Tyranitar. Oh, and uh, people like Mirror B. So you're valid if you like this game. You probably like a lot of games I don't. You know what? More power to you. I'm over here having absolutely zero fun for the last year and a half, 100% completing this game multiple times as I make my way through all the content in Gen 3, and you're over there enjoying your life. And that's great! I'm happy for you! I wish I could enjoy this game even an ounce as much as you do. I'd be better off for it. But I have to be totally honest and say that Pokemon Coliseum is probably my absolute least favorite Pokemon game. Worse than Fire Red and Leaf Green. Worse than Diamond and Pearl. So, if you're not here for the negativity, thanks for checking out the video. I have other positive Pokemon reviews you might enjoy, and I hope I'll see you in the next one. But if you're one of the brave ones here to spelunk down into the salt mines of misery with me and find out what could be so bad about this weird experiment in Pokemon history, stick around. We're getting into it right now. Part one. Hey everyone. Sorry I'm late, it's a jungle out there. I had to beat an old lady with a stick to get these cranberries. Now I don't like to do this, but I think it may be necessary to recap what's actually in the game before I get into my critiques. Since according to VG charts, only 2.5 million people ever bought this game over its retail lifetime. Which is fewer people than have subscribed to Pokemane. Fewer people have bought this game new than have listened to the song Two Trucks by Lemon Demon. More people have watched some of my videos on YouTube than gave Nintendo their money dollars for this thing is what I'm saying. So just so that we're all on the same page, I'll give you a little rundown. Pokemon Coliseum is essentially a typical Pokemon RPG, but with a few twists. First, the game is entirely double battles, no singles. Second, you can't catch wild Pokemon, but instead all of the Pokemon you can obtain in the game are shadow Pokemon that you snag from other trainers. There are only 48 shadow Pokemon in the game, and they appear in linear order as you progress through the story with some appearing only in the post-game. Third, your job isn't to earn gym badges or to complete a Pokedex, but rather to get to the end of the linear story and also maybe purify all the shadow Pokemon you catch and turn them into normal Pokemon again. You play as Wes, who has an Espeon and an Umbreon at the start of the game, and you journey through seven main areas fighting two enemy teams, Team Snagum and Team Cypher. The main mechanic set of the game is unchanged from Ruby and Sapphire. It's the same battle system with nature's abilities, all the same moves, and so on and so forth. But there are a few new mechanics added on that go along with the addition of these Shadow Pokemon. Each Shadow Pokemon knows only one Shadow move, Shadow Rush, which deals a decent amount of neutral damage to every type in the game, but also deals recoil damage to the user. Using this Shadow move also has a chance to trigger Hyper Mode, a mode in which the Pokemon is less obedient, but also more likely to land critical hits. There are some other quirks of being in Hyper Mode too, like you're unable to use healing items on Pokemon in Hyper Mode. Using a turn in battle to call the Pokemon snaps it out of the this mode. When you first catch a shadow Pokemon, it only has Shadow Rush, but as you lower its heart gauge you get access to other move slots with normal moves in them, and you can also see information about the Pokemon like its nature on the status screen. There are a few different methods for purifying shadow Pokemon, and which method is most effective is dependent on the Pokemon's nature. Shadow Pokemon do not gain experience, but will be awarded any experience that they would have earned during battle below the first two bars of the heart gauge once they're finally purified. Most of the game is pretty easy, but the last few fights in the post-game content are really difficult, mostly for the reason that there are some pretty severe level jumps in this game, and you start at a high enough level from the word go that gaining new levels doesn't come quickly even for purified Pokemon. The game starts at level 25 and ends somewhere pretty close to level 70, making this one of the highest scaling games in the series. You may have guessed, once the heart gauge is totally empty, you can take them to a special location in the game, 
the relic stone located in Agate Village, and Celebi shows up and turns them into normal Pokemon again. That's about it, but another major change is that you cannot save anywhere like you can in a normal Pokemon game. Here you can only save at PCs. Aside from the story mode, there's also a battle mode that works a lot like Pokemon Stadium, in which you beat a few difficulty levels of trainers with a registered team from your Game Boy Advance, and this time you can earn Poke coupons to exchange for prizes for your Game Boy Advance games. And finally, in this mess is also Mount Battle, a 100 trainer marathon mode that you can get Ho-Oh for clearing if you've caught and purified every single Shadow Pokemon first. All the Pokemon you catch in Colosseum can be traded to any Game Boy Advance Pokemon game, assuming that you've met all of the requirements to trade. And 20 years on, this is the only way to get some of these Pokemon and items in Gen 3. These modes are both completely separate from the story mode on the main menu and are accessed from a completely separate battle menu. But confusingly, Mount Battle is also a location in the story mode as well, and clearing it in one mode has different rewards than clearing it in another. So this game has a lot of things going on. It's a main series Pokemon game with its own campaign that has nothing to do with Ruby and Sapphire. But then it's also a way to obtain items in Pokemon that you can't get in the main series in your copy of Ruby and Sapphire. And then it's also partially a Pokemon Stadium. And then it's also not at all a main series Pokemon game, because it asks you to play it completely differently than you would a main series game, and was designed by people who had never played Pokemon games before. It has a lot of balls in the air, because it's not really built like a typical RPG would be. It's picking and choosing established parts of the existing Pokemon series to sort of marry together, while also introducing a whole set of its own mechanics. It's kind of like a Frankenstein's monster game where none of these ideas were ever really created with the goal that they would be used in this way, and they're all kind of forced into this package together where none of it really fits or makes all that much sense. And honestly, I'm a bit overwhelmed about how I'm going to explain this all to you so that you will understand on how many levels this game just does not work. Well, we have to start somewhere, so let's start with why this game exists in the first place. It's sort of ironic that this game is well liked for offering something supposedly really unique in terms of atmosphere and content. That is true if you've played mostly Nintendo games, or mostly only Pokemon games. I can see why it's unique out of that narrow sample group. But if you zoom out a bit more to gaming trends in the early to mid aughts, you might have a hard time picking it out of the lineup. Across the sixth generation of consoles, the edgy badass anti-hero trend that Coliseum slots into was the dominant one. The millennial kids were getting older and craving content that satisfied a more adult palette, and the baby games they grew up up with just wouldn't cut it anymore. This trend reached its peak by 2006, but even in the previous hardware generation, the Nintendo 64 had undersold compared to the PlayStation, which dominated with broad third-party support and games that appealed to older, grittier sensibilities. In Japan, the Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest games were top sellers on the PlayStation, and Final Fantasy even found success in the US on the system. So when Nintendo was struggling to keep up with the PlayStation by powering up their cartridge-based console with a disc-based add-on, the 64DD, they lucked out and the people at Square and the people at Enix were looking to develop a Final Fantasy Fantasy and a Dragon Quest game for it. Too bad neither ever materialized and both wound up on the PlayStation instead. Nintendo would need to come up with another way to win that crowd over for their next console if they wanted a chance to grab back some of that market share. You might notice that I've been talking about Nintendo this whole time and not Game Freak. Well, you may remember from the Fire Red and Leaf Green video that at the end of Gen 2 and the start of Gen 3, Game Freak, Nintendo, and Creatures settled who would have control over the Pokemon franchise by forming the Pokemon Company, with each party getting roughly a third share. Before that had happened, Nintendo was basically throwing the Pokemon IP onto anything they could, like the unrelated Jack and the Beanstalk game becoming Pokemon Snap. Before all the duties fell to Ishihara after the Pokemon Company was settled at the end of the 90s, a guy named Takashi Kawaguchi at Nintendo was in charge of handling Pokemon for a while. A fellow Ape alumni, he was the public relations manager at the time, and was one of the key players in Pokemon's initial success in Japan and marketing the brand over there. Actually, he was originally introduced to Tajiri through Ishihara, and it was through Kawaguchi that the Pokemon concept originally reached Nintendo in the first place. There's this interview with him from around the development of Gold and Silver, where he very ominously describes Pokemon as a killer app, and that he hopes Nintendo will be able to utilize Pokemon's success on new hardware. It benefited Nintendo to be able to use the hot Pokemon name and characters to make projects profitable that otherwise wouldn't have been, including, say, new consoles. And Game Freak had to pretty much just trust Nintendo, because they had no formal process for fielding what projects would get greenlit and what projects would not when they had three companies who all partially owned the rights. Game Freak has repeatedly expressed that they believe Pokemon worked better as a handheld game over the years. In fact, Masuda reiterated this idea the year after Colosseum was released in the 2004 edition of the Prima Collector's Pokedex. Ouch. 
Anyway, they were also busy with the development of Ruby and Sapphire. And this is just an assumption, but maybe Nintendo approached them about making a Pokemon RPG for the GameCube at some point and they turned it down. We have absolutely no information to confirm or deny this, so it's anyone's guess whether Game Freak was ever asked to be involved at all. But then Nintendo did something kind of sneaky. This could have happened one of two ways. The first way is that Nintendo could have snuck it into development right before the Pokemon company was formed and they would no longer have free reign to do whatever they wanted with the IP. Incorporating the Pokemon company was underway at the time Nintendo were developing the GameCube, then known as the Dolphin, in 1998. Now this date is when the company was actually created, but according to Iwata, they didn't actually settle all the rights between the three companies and come up with formal agreements until after he was hired in 2000. The Pokemon Company trademark doesn't begin appearing on products until 2001, so it's likely that the process in which Game Freak would have had a say in which projects got greenlit wouldn't have been set up until this time. The director of Coliseum claims that the development of the game began in June 2002 when Genius Sonority was founded, but for reasons I'll explain in a second, there's a possibility that's not entirely true. If it is true, Coliseum was made in the span of about 12 months, which while still possible, would probably be hellish for the developers and might account for some of the issues I have with the game. But regardless, if we assume that that isn't true and development started earlier, that would put the start of production in this time span before the Pokemon Company was formed. The other way this game could have been made without Game Freak's involvement is that after the Pokemon Company was formed, if Coliseum truly did begin development in 2002, Nintendo would only need creatures to agree to the game in order to override Game Freak with the majority vote to go ahead and make the game without their approval. This is, I guess, less sneaky, but it would also be the worst of the two possible scenarios for Game Freak because it would mean that not only was Nintendo hijacking their series, Ishihara was also willing to sell them out. Ishihara and Iwata were BFFs after all, so I guess that's not all that surprising. To be fair to Ishihara in this situation, maybe he thought he was just doing his job by making a safety net for the series to fall back on in case Ruby and Sapphire failed commercially. Still, I can't imagine that it was super fun for Game Freak to deal with the pressure of developing the first Pokemon games after Pokemania had ended, and then also most likely having resources pulled from their already struggling Ruby and Sapphire team to explain to a different team of programmers how their game works so that those programmers could put those ideas into a game that they never wanted to exist in the first place. Most likely, the obfuscation of the timeline by the developers Nintendo is due to the drama with Manabu Yamana. Yamana, the director of Pokemon Coliseum, at the time development would have likely begun, was also a Dragon Quest dev and headed Heartbeat, a studio that produced Dragon Quest games and seemed poised to become the studio mainly responsible for them after Dragon Quest VII. DQ7 was the Dragon Quest game that was originally going to be on the 64 DD, and then hopped over to the PlayStation and sold 4 million copies, becoming the second bestseller on the system in Japan, despite being released super late for the system in 2000. Following this smash hit, Heartbeat closed suddenly and mysteriously in January 2002 despite its success. Then within the span of a few months, Nintendo spent a million dollars forming a new studio, Genius Sonority, explicitly to develop this Pokemon RPG for their upcoming system, the GameCube, without Game Freak's involvement, and instead with a huge chunk of the people who used to work at Heartbeat, including Yamana, and the Star Wars manga guy to do the art direction, all of whom had no prior experience with Pokemon. Supposedly, Yamana felt snubbed by Enix that they were not automatically chosen to develop Dragon Quest VIII after Dragon Quest VII took way too long to make and was willing to pursue other work. Mind you, this would have been before the merger, so Enix, who made the Dragon Quest games, is not to be confused with Square, who made the Final Fantasy games. Anyway, there may have been some kind of non-compete contract clause that prevented Nintendo and the folks at Heartbeat from going public with the agreement until after Heartbeat was closed and Yamana could work independently, but this is conjecture. Still, the timing of all this is very suspicious, needless to say, that it might have been Nintendo's last chance to pull a move like this without Game Freak's approval when they chose to make Coliseum, and the fact that Yamana and the crew suddenly hastily cut ties to Heartbeat as well when they weren't getting what they wanted from Enix. Basically, if Game Freak wouldn't or couldn't play ball in making a console Pokemon game, Nintendo was going to take their IP and make their own version of it as a killer app for the GameCube, essentially competing directly with the Pokemon games that Game Freak were developing for the Game Boy Advance. After all, if Kahlo took off and became more successful than its handheld counterparts, Game Freak would be forced to make more system sellers for Nintendo and abandon their vision of Pokemon remaining handheld only. And why not stick it to Enix in the process too? Supposedly, the reason Dragon Quest VIII never got localized was because Yamana pulled the plug on Heartbeat. Nintendo was clearly willing to do some shady business to ensure the GameCube wouldn't meet the same fate as the Nintendo 64 and be squashed by edgier games on other systems. And I'm sure they thought this would work. And what Game Freak thought of all this is impossible to know. I wasn't there, and primary sources of information are 
are not available to fill this part in. At least not what I've found floating around out there. It's possible as a gesture of goodwill so that things would not end up actually hostile between Game Freak and Nintendo. Nintendo promised that the game would also include connectivity features with the Game Boy Advance games and more incentive to own all of the Nintendo systems and Pokemon games was never a bad thing for Nintendo's bottom line either. Or maybe Game Freak didn't mind, and just accepted the part of working with Nintendo meant things like this happening from time to time. But I think it is telling that Game Freak has never publicly commented on the game in interviews when they have commented on other spin-offs like Stadium and Snap, until the Switch games they repeated their desire for Pokemon to remain handheld only, and when a fan brought the idea of remastering Pokemon Coliseum up to them in 2016, Masuda flat out laughed in his face and said no! So to me, the only thing actually dark about this game is that it seems to be made out of complete desperation on Nintendo's part, and the only thing that they risked was their relationship with Game Freak to do it. You can see why then, if what happened was Nintendo came up with an idea for a more mature, edgier Pokemon game, and then hired a bunch of people who had only worked on other series to take what Game Freak had established in the mechanics of Gen 3 already, and build a completely different game around it, that not all elements of this mesh completely. It's working backwards, filling something out until you have a product that looks enough like other things that already exist to pass, instead of coming up with a set of mechanics from the ground up that's designed to facilitate the telling of a certain story or the building of characters. You know, things that might be important in an RPG. I don't think it's necessarily a soulless product with no care put into it all the way through, as 20 years on, the people who worked on the game still express affection for it on their social media accounts, with absolutely no financial incentive to do so, as Nintendo has seemingly no plans to ever re-release the game, so that's something. I would look back on the project project fondly too if my options were to make this game on Nintendo's dime or be out of the job, and a lot of the staff at Genius Sonority went on to join the staff of Game Freak, so this was a career starter for some people. One positive thing about Coliseum, people were definitely employed. So I'm not faulting the people who worked on this game for it not all coming together. Instead, I think it's kind of the best they could have done given the circumstances, and what were probably Nintendo's demands for what the game was like in the end. If you plant a flower in nutrient-deficient soil, there's only so much it can bloom. For the same reasons that Nintendo was motivated to jump on the edgy, darker game trend in the early 2000s, I was sick of it. Every game was about a badass dude with a gun or a sword, everything was shades of grey, brown, and green camo, all the characters you could play as represented one very singular type of identity, and it was all very unappealing to me personally. Now I want to make it clear that if you did find these games with darker aesthetics appealing, there's nothing wrong with that. They were popular for a reason. A huge percentage of the market was demanding content that looked like this. So where there's demand, there's supply. I was an outlier though, since I wasn't really the target demographic of these games, and the type of wish fulfillment that they offered wasn't really broad enough to include everyone who didn't identify, or want to identify, with a badass hetero dude. I'm only speaking for myself, obviously, but I found it a bit alienating to be reminded that my needs and wants are pretty unimportant in the grand scheme just by virtue of being the odd one out. So imagine my disappointment when... It's missing the weapons, but it checks pretty much all the other boxes. So obviously, this game did not appeal to me. But no big deal, right? I could just skip it and play the next Pokemon game, which was coming out within a year of this one. Well, this is where I have to suggest you watch my last video about the Gen 3 Dexit controversy if you want this video to make any sense whatsoever. If you have not seen my previous video about the Gen 3 Dexit, I highly encourage you to watch that first, because I made it specifically because I was going to need to talk about this game, but the topic of game rentals was too broad to fit into this already too long video. Consider that video a prelude to this, the final review in this Gen 3 trilogy. I think that this video will not make a lot of sense if you didn't watch that one first, so please just pause this one, go watch the other video, and then come back when you're done, okay? Okay. If you have seen that video, you would know that at the time Coliseum came out, it was the only way to get Johto Pokemon that were missing from Hoenn's regional decks. So I ended up getting this game anyway and playing it for that reason. For all those super popular Johto mons you couldn't get in Ruby and Sapphire any other way. And boy, playing a game that you find somewhat alienating to the end credits just to trade Pokemon out of it and into one of the few video games you do like, well that's not a great way to experience any video game. It's okay, I will permit you to bust out all of those teeny tiny vibes violins you've been waiting to play for me in my extremely first world problems, but not every video game appealed exclusively to me. Don't worry about me, I've been in therapy for years. 
I'll be okay someday. But anyway, hopefully that clues you into why some of the things that were widely regarded as positive aspects of this game wouldn't necessarily be positives for me, and are going to influence my experience with the game. It's hard to keep an open mind and stop and smell the roses when you're playing a game you don't like and find actively alienating to try and get something in a game you do like. And do bear in mind, this exact scenario was not me accidentally finding the worst possible reason to get this game and the worst way to experience it on purpose. This scenario was engineered by the folks at Nintendo and Game Freak as a way to sell more games by chopping the decks up and holding popular Pokemon as a carrot on a string in front of their fan base. A sale to a kid who is uninterested in the content of the game but wants a Suicune and Ruby is still a sale made and they leverage demand for Johto Pokemon to dupe more idiots like me into buying this game. I don't feel like that one is entirely on me for playing the game not as intended if they outright wanted kids to do this and benefited financially from the strategy. Because I've mostly rushed to the end of this game in the past in order to trade, I had to play through it again multiple times for this video, to make sure that if I was putting together an analysis of this game, that it was as accurate as I could manage within the limitations of the human condition, and that I wasn't just misrepresenting everything as worse than it actually was due to my aforementioned bias. I also had a lot of really helpful conversations with members of my Patreon Twitch sub Discord, to develop some of my analysis with people who actually liked the game and were able to see things in it that weren't so obvious to me. So I do want to give a big thank you to everybody who helped me do some reality testing and see outside my own perspective a bit. I may not have come out of this experience actually liking the game, but I do understand it a lot better than I did before. All that being said, I am still a human with a brain that analyzes things subjectively, but I did put in some effort to make sure that my critiques were in good faith, and I hope that shows. Part 2. I guess you haven't heard. I'm the sheriff around these parts. Okay, so there's really only one main issue I have with the storytelling in this game. The lack of stakes and the world building. Oops, that's two things. Number one, lack of stakes. I think because there are probably no design goals for the game other than make it edgier, the premise runs a bit thin pretty quickly. They didn't really seem to think about the implications of their setup very much or have any interest in writing a story or characters that take advantage of it. This is not a problem for every player because I think Pokemon fans tend to have big imaginations and if you suggest a cool idea to them, they'll happily take that and fill in the blanks with whatever makes the idea cooler or make more sense. And maybe that's even intentionally what the game is encouraging you to do. Everything in this game regarding any kind of setup, story, or characters is left very, very vague, so there's a lot of blanks to fill in. But for me, for an RPG, that's a bit of a risky strategy for creating enough motivation or setting up enough stakes to keep a player invested enough to actually play through to the end, especially when the game is pretty light on the typical role-playing conventions that allow players to make character-building decisions. So to begin with, the story in this game is pretty bare-bones. The main threat of the game, the thing that gets you from place to place, is that Wes, the main character, is traveling around trying to find out more about Cypher, the main enemy team, and who is creating the Shadow Pokémon. He doesn't necessarily set out with this goal in mind from the word go when he steals the Stag Machine for unknown reasons, but he stumbles into the plot by being in the right place at the right time to see a girl tied up in a sack who happens to be able to see the Shadow Pokémon. This puts Cypher on his radar and vice versa, and you spend the remainder of the game tracking down leads that might help you confront them and I guess maybe stop them from making Shadow Pokemon, but that part is not super clear. At the end of the game, you catch up to the main baddies, Nascar and Evice, at their big tower and after a series of battles, they're finally apprehended. But after the credits roll, they also immediately bust out of jail, which makes me wonder what, if anything, we actually accomplished. Why Cypher wants to take over the world, or how they plan to use Shadow Dunsparce to do it is never explained, and despite the game being framed as kind of a detective fact-finding story, not very much is ever uncovered by the player about the enemy team and their motives. The meat of the game is sort of a loose string of vignettes exploring the ideas of criminality, greed, and vigilantism, tied together through the lens of your detective work to chase down the baddies, and mostly this just provides the basis for a few cool set pieces. Throughout the game, there are good characters who break the law in order to do what's right, there are bad characters who are not held accountable for what they do due to the incompetence and slowness of the justice system, and the very act of stealing Shadow Pokémon as a means of rescuing them from harm grapples with the idea that rules are not always put in place to protect us or for the sake of justice. Characters are wrongfully imprisoned, characters are wrongfully freed, and the badass protagonist is the only one with the power to make things right again when the system lets everyone down. It's not an extremely deep concept or anything. 
These themes are pretty much exactly what you'd expect if you hire a comic book artist to come up with a video game concept, but nevertheless it does have something to say about justice and what turns people to do bad things. The problem is, the game is much more interested in creating a power fantasy for the player than it is in actually exploring these ideas, and the biggest casualty of this is Wes's characterization. Wes is established as an outsider to the region of Ore by this bit of dialogue at the beginning of the game and the fact that you fill in locations on the map as he learns about them. So, considering you spend the entire time trying to find information about Shadow Pokemon, presumably Wes begins the game not knowing anything about Ore and not knowing Shadow Pokemon exist, despite working for Team Snagum, who's involved in this scheme. This presents an interesting conflict right off the bat, right? If Wes didn't know about Cypher from the start of the game, what motivated him to break off from Team Snagum and take the Snag Machine with him? Is Wes a good person deep down who wanted to turn over a new leaf, or is Wes a bad person who wants to use the Snag Machine for personal gain? Wes's motivations are not explained because the game wants you to consider the idea that criminality can come from anywhere, criminals are not always bad people, and that it's not so black and white. You yourself could be a criminal. Any of us could. And I guess on the flip side, anyone could be a hero too. It's kind of a wish fulfillment story that positions you and what you want and your power to exact your will on the world as the highest priority, but it's not a fully shallow idea that has no merit either. But for such a gritty game aesthetically, it doesn't seem interested in exploring the downsides of one person picking up the slack for an entire failed justice system or providing any consequences. As the great Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility but we don't get a sense of that in this story. Many similar pieces of media that grapple with the idea that a hero can come from anywhere, or examine the idea of vigilantism, usually create a situation where that hero has to make a difficult choice to do the right thing, or that they have something to lose. Spider-Man, for example, is all about Peter Parker struggling with having personal relationships and aspirations, and having to give those things up to be a hero. But Wes isn't even from Ore. He doesn't know anyone who lives there until the game begins, and he has absolutely no stake in what's going on there, since he had already made the decision to leave Team Snagum before getting involved in the Shadow Pokemon plot. He pretty much just rolls right into a town he doesn't know and decides he's the new sheriff. No one he snags Pokemon from ever retaliates or even is mad at him for what he does. They'll all give you helpful tips on how to use the Shadow Pokemon as if you're their neighbor borrowing a Weed Whacker. If the hero has nothing to lose, it's kind of hard to care about anything that he does because there's no tension, no stakes. And unlike most role-playing games, Colosseum doesn't give the player tools to make up for what the writing lacks with the actual mechanics of its gameplay. So let's think about the idea really quickly of what a role-playing game is. If you've seen my other videos, you've also heard some of the spiel before. But for the new friends, let's talk for a second. On the simplest, most basic level, an RPG is a game that allows you to play the role of somebody. Usually entries into this genre are sort of like solo D&D campaigns, and have a bunch of back-end systems that exist for players to work within or around to build stories and characters and have experiences based on playing within those constraints. The systems take the place of the human DM to allow for solo roleplay. In most Pokemon games, the way these systems help build a narrative is that they provide hundreds if not thousands of permutations of different species, movesets, types, and abilities for the player to piece together a party with, and the party building itself is how the player creates a self-constructed narrative for their journey. The character in the mainline Pokemon games has even fewer defined traits than Wes does, but it doesn't matter because the role-playing aspects of the game allow you to make choices about who you want them to be, and decide a lot about their narrative and growth as a character. Everyone is playing the same overarching narrative as they work their way through the linear single player, but everyone's journey is going to involve different stories about how they met each member of their team and why they chose to give it a spot in their party, and even what movesets they use and what role they play within the party. It's the kind of system that lends itself really well to replaying the same content again and again, because no matter how many times you play through the same game and take down Team Aqua, you're going to have a different experience, different parts of the game will be difficult or easy depending on who you choose to have in your party, and why. And the answer to the question of why you chose who you did provides an expressive element of play as well, defining who your character is as a Pokemon trainer. But not every RPG needs to do this this way to be fun or fulfilling. There are RPGs like Earthbound, for example, where you have a set party, a set group of kids, you don't really get to pick other than naming them, and you can't choose who is with you at any given moment in the story. And rather than exploring each character through different builds and different weapons, the options are limited enough that there really is kind of an optimal answer for what item on what character you should be using at what point in the story to overcome the specific challenges that you'll face. So most people's playthroughs of a game like Earthbound end up looking pretty much the same. 
and most people are going to be using the same characters the same way and solving the same problems. Does that make Earthbound a bad RPG? Of course not, because instead it provides a really well thought out story driven narrative where the characters learn about themselves and each other and explore interesting locations and themes. Ness doesn't say much and takes on whatever name you give him, but he's far from a blank slate and has a real character arc where he learns about himself and grows as a person. This type of RPG is sort of akin more to the one-off campaigns with preset characters you'd find in D&D. It's not that it's not role-playing, it just lets you play the role of a specific predefined character in a specific predefined way, and provides a lot of motivation for you to want to do that through the storytelling itself and the challenges it puts in your path to overcome. It's less expressive, sure, but it can communicate a lot of important ideas and themes through the way it tailors the experience it provides. Now, Earthbound and mainline Pokemon games are not the only two types of RPGs that exist out there. They're just two points on a spectrum of systems and design goals that range from really free and expressive to really narrow and focused. But I thought they provided a good example of two ways these games can be designed that are pretty dramatically different while still both being worthwhile experiences. So now, coming back to Pokemon Coliseum, we need to ask ourselves what kind of role-playing game is this? This game obviously does not provide the exact role-playing experience of a main series Pokemon game, because you're limited to a pretty narrow selection of Pokemon, and there's not a lot of room to experiment here with team combinations when there are so many constraints on who you get to use and how you can use them. There is some variation in how players experience the game, but there's usually an optimal answer for what type of Pokemon to use where in the game and how to use them. And because party acquisition is linear, everyone is going to have the same answers to the question of how they got each member of their team and why they added it to their party. You're not really going to experience this game differently multiple times through. You'll just learn what to do to optimize and waste a little less time trying things that don't work. In this game, not only are your party options limited to the few Pokemon you can catch where you are at in the story, but they're also almost entirely stacked in terms of leveling up and learning new moves or evolving. For the most part, you don't get to build movesets. You don't really get to level up team members and watch them grow or get stronger, or experiment with different combinations of Pokemon if you're only using unpurified Pokemon for the sake of purifying them, and you're removing them from your party the second they can actually start growing in favor of the next Pokemon, in order to make a dent in that huge backlog of shadow Pokemon you're catching. So clearly, Colosseum isn't interested in allowing you to make the decisions that might let you provide your own characterization for West through the mechanics. But it's not really similar to Earthbound either, because instead of using the controlled nature of the party building to facilitate the telling of a specific story with a specific message it wants to get across, the main character you play as is a blank slate self-insert in a very basic story where little is fleshed out or defined about what you're doing. He's a vessel for the player to feel like a badass, but they didn't really bother to come up with anything else to make up for that in the gameplay or the writing. So it doesn't really provide me personally with a lot of motivation to guide these characters to the end of the journey, with very few choices that impact the outcome of anything, and pretty weakly defined stakes for me to care about. As a person who actually tends to enjoy the RPG aspects of RPGs, this does not really do the things that most RPGs do to provide interesting systems or storytelling for me to explore in the role of the character. When I talk to people about this game, most can't even agree what the basic goal of the game is. Whether catching or purifying all the Pokemon is the goal, or whether that's optional, whether you're just supposed to get to the end credits and call it a day, what's actually accomplished by the main character by the time you get to the end credits, and so on. Because there's not even a thesis statement here. You have to self-motivate through the entire story, because what Wes is actually setting out to do in this game is never established. I think it may be necessary in this story about looking at vigilantism and how some people interact with the law and how you can break the law for good reasons and for bad reasons and so on, that there's a somewhat clear moral good that some characters are working for to juxtapose with the bad that most of the characters do. Not knowing why Wes wants to do anything he does or why Cypher wants to take over the world or whatever and how Shadow Pokemon actually play into those plans, it kind of neutralizes them in the context of right and wrong. Because it's vague and there's nothing really in the text that supports it either way, all interpretations are equally baseless. Maybe Wes wants to use the Pokemon he purified for armed robbery. Or maybe he starts a Pokemon sanctuary where they all retire and never battle again.
again. Who knows? Basically, Colosseum is a Rorschach test. It's what you make of it. And you'll have a better time the more you're willing to use your imagination to do a lot of the world and character building for them. It's not that Colosseum is really deep or complex or anything, it's more the opposite. It's so simple and the concepts are so superficial that your brain needs to fill in the depth that it's lacking. This is either an interesting experimental work of art that I just personally don't get, or it's the bare minimum amount of effort they thought they could get away with. You decide. Number two. World building. Most of the information that the game does provide that could help fill in those gaps is in the visuals and environments of the game. The old mining towns drawing greedy gold rushers to an otherwise inhospitable desert, the serene, opulent, but corrupt big cities and towers built by and for the ultra-rich while the working class lives underground, this is all used to help fill in that information about what motivates crime and strengthen those themes. It makes those ink blots more defined, and helps people draw conclusions that are actually supported by the text of the game rather than at random. Personally, it did not come easily for me to interpret these visual cues as meaningful world-building information the way it seems to for some people and I think it would have been a little bit harder to miss the ways the environment helps tell the story if the developers had made any effort to tie them to the mechanics whatsoever. In main series Pokemon games, the environments are important for providing world building too, and so to tie them mechanically to the rest of the game, exploration becomes super important. Whether you're trying to solve environmental puzzles, using HM moves, physically trekking from place to place, exploring to find more trainers and Pokemon to battle, the game forces you to notice things about the setting by having you so frequently interact with it. You notice things like the absence of Pokemon in the underground pass because you have to walk a long stretch with nothing happening, contrasted to the majority of the game where you can't take three steps without running into a Zubat. Or you notice the ocean because you have to physically find a way to cross it and it has unique encounters compared to the land. In Colosseum, the game could take place under the ocean or three million miles in the air and it wouldn't change anything about what you actually do, because there are absolutely no mechanics that interact with the different elements of the maps. The visual information would be different, but the actual gameplay would not change. The game is actually designed more similarly to a Dragon Quest game, where there's a map and a bunch of towns as destinations. Except even Dragon Quest has more exploration than this, because you have to actually cross the map and deal with random encounters and decide how to get to where you want to go. There's not always as much of an exploration element to each area, but you can wander around this map and find things hidden way, way out of the way, like secret towers or new villages. And a lot of the time, the game makes you do that to progress the story. In Colosseum, you don't get this opportunity to make Ori a bigger player in the story because you warp from place to place. The lack of wild encounters, usually considered a positive by fans of this game, is actually a bit of a detriment in my opinion because it was one of the ways they could have made each location matter a bit more to the actual experience of the game. Different Pokemon could show up in each area or pose some kind of obstacle to overcome. Instead, all there is are Dragon Quest style towns that you warp between, except smaller and with less to do. And I think to make up for the missing exploration, they just want you to get as confused as possible so that you spend as much time as possible in each one, running around and trying to figure out what to do next. Because you don't don't travel to each one, you don't get a good sense of natural momentum for what will move the story forward. In most games, if you come into a town from one direction, you tend to move through it the same way you came in and intuit what parts of it are important by looking at the different sizes and shapes of the buildings and which elements are emphasized. In Colosseum, you enter every town from the south by default, important and unimportant buildings look identical, and everything in most of the towns of the game is laid out kind of symmetrically, so there's nothing super obvious guiding you from building to building and no landmarks to help you remember your way around. The mayor's house looks like a random NPC's house. The police station is barely distinguished from the buildings around it by a tiny light on the roof. The triggers for what will cause the next plot event to happen are also placed somewhat randomly, and I have to assume that this is probably on purpose. Almost every time a new area is introduced, it begins as a dead end. The Colosseums, the first time you visit each one, you can't enter the challenge and are told to come back later. There's a couple new places on the map that are introduced with all the doors locked and all you can do is leave again once you arrive. But a lot of the time these dead ends are where they actually put triggers for story events. The first time you arrive in Phenac, if you explore every building, you'll enter the Colosseum, be told you can't do anything there, and leave, and nothing will happen. But if you go to the mayor's house, he tells you to check out the Colosseum. It's easy to misinterpret this and think, oh, I've already been there, there's nothing to do. But if you go back to the Colosseum, get told you can't enter it again, and then leave after doing nothing again, then the next plot event happens. And the plot event has nothing logically to do with the Colosseum, it's totally unrelated. Again, in a main series Pokemon game, the triggers to move forward are usually associated with obvious progression milestones, like earning badges or solving environmental puzzles related in some way to the event. Here, instead of creating puzzles to solve together, 
give you things to do. Instead, they just put the triggers for what will happen next in completely unintuitive places, so you have to wander around the same tiny towns again and again. Even the dungeons are pretty much just linear hallways full of dudes to fight, very few puzzles to solve, and very little to look at. The only challenge comes from the fact that in these areas, the camera is so zoomed in that it's easy to get disoriented. That's one of the reasons I had a hard time paying attention to the details in the backgrounds of a lot of these maps, because these buildings full of fodder battles are so boring they erode my attention span, and even if I wanted to, the camera is really tight on the player so you can't see much of what's around you. This is all a pretty big problem if the environments are doing so much of the work and filling in world building details, because the only mechanics in this game, with no traveling, no puzzles, no wild Pokemon to find and catch, are just about battling. And the background might change depending on the area, but the actual content you experience does not. All of the elements of a game that are part of the storytelling, the environments, the character designs, the dialogue, and the mechanics should be working together to tell the same story, but in this game they're all disconnected. Colosseum isn't a game totally devoid of meaning or effort put into world building, but it isn't very well designed as an entry into the RPG genre if you can play the entire game multiple times without engaging with any RPG aspects. The seams along which it falls apart are pretty symptomatic of the the fact that it's a story dropped on top of an existing set of mechanics and not built with mechanics that really lend themselves to the type of themes they chose to explore. I'm not saying that nobody who worked on this game cared, but between the pandering to popular trends in regards to its aesthetics and the fact that it wholesale borrows mechanics from an existing series and is only notably different from that series due to the things that it omits, I would say that this game really doesn't have a strong identity of its own and it comes across as kind of a shallow attempt to ride trends without fully thinking through the implications of the few unique ideas it does have. Part 3. How do I shot web? Un, dos, un, dos, tres, <laughs> Most of what's terrible to play about this game boils down to the fact that pretty much every single one of the new mechanics clashes horribly with all of the old mechanics they imported from Ruby and Sapphire and do not lend themselves to the strengths of a Pokemon game and the ways Pokemon is actually fun to play. It's like they looked at the main series Pokemon games and picked up all the really fiddly number driven systems bits and didn't notice any of the parts that make those systems actually enjoyable to interact with. Actually a lot of the new mechanics don't even work very well with the themes that were introduced in this game either. And these are not new observations. People have been complaining about this stuff since the game came out, but let's really like dig deep and break down all the ways in which these don't work because that's more fun to me than actually playing this game. Now mind you, in this section, I'm going to be talking about these mechanics from the standpoint of taking them to their logical conclusions based on the implications of what these systems are trying to accomplish, rather than talking about how every player actually engages with them in reality. Not everyone is going to even be aware of every mechanic that exists in the game, so I'm not talking about what the majority of players actually experience when they play Colosseum. Instead, what I mean is, if you were to look at each system, look at the goal of the game, which is presumably to catch and purify all the shadow Pokemon you find, and then optimize your playstyle specifically to accomplish this goal as efficiently as possible within the mechanics that they've built, this is what I think logically is the outcome. That's what I typically do when I review a Pokemon game. Look under the hood at the chosen set of mechanics and what they were trying to accomplish. So let's start with that heart gauge and purifying Pokemon. There are five ways to lower a Pokemon's heart gauge sending a Pokemon out into battle, calling a Pokemon to snap them out of hyper mode, having the Pokemon in your party and walking around, putting the Pokemon into the daycare Nagate village, and using scents from your cologne case on them. Each method is effective some amount on every Pokemon more or less, but depending on a Pokemon's nature, some methods may be more or less effective. For example, even though for both relaxed Pokemon and calm Pokemon, the daycare lowers it the most compared to other methods, the daycare will lower it 600 points every 256 steps walked if it's relaxed, but only 450 points if it's calm. Additionally, the maximum length of the gauge itself is dependent on the Pokemon species. The lowest a Pokemon's heart gauge can be is 3,000 points total, and the maximum it can be is 20,000. This number ran ramps up linearly, so as you progress through the game, it will take longer and longer to purify each Pokemon you get. And there's a catch, because you can't actually see what nature a Pokemon is until you've already lowered the heart gauge two entire bars which means for nearly half of each gauge, you're walking around totally blind and will not be able to optimize. Now this may be surprising information to a lot of people, even who have beaten this game, because most people have no idea that this system exists. And although the game does mention it to you vaguely in the Ein files you can pick up, the reason most people don't know it exists is because it's pretty impossible to understand it fully just by playing the game and without data mining to find out what method is most effective on what nature. 
You could blindly try each method on every Pokemon and see what's the most effective, but since each species also has a different length heart gauge that is also impossible to know because the game never tells you, it is impossible to visually tell the difference between taking off 300 points on a Pokemon with 3,000 points on their gauge and taking off 600 points on a Pokemon with 6,000 points. So the first method, battling, is scaled so that for natures where it's most effective, it takes 200 off the gauge every time they're sent into battle, and for natures where it's least effective, only 50. I think they intended this to be an easily repeatable method for some reason, given the low cap on points it can take off. But it actually only procs once per battle per Pokemon, no matter how many times the same Pokemon is switched in and out. It's fairly difficult to use this method effectively because these battles are quite long, so the time between procs can actually end up longer than other methods with higher caps. So this method is kind of like a bonus, but not very reliable as a primary way to get the gauge down. Unfortunately, natures that have this method as their most effective also tend to have really low purification rates and everything else, effectively leaving them with virtually no best way to purify them. It's almost like this method was designed for grinding out wild Pokemon battles, which would be shorter and more easily repeatable in a shorter period of time than trainer battles where each trainer has multiple Pokemon, but there are of course no wild battles in this game. The second method, walking around with the Pokemon in your party, is scaled pretty similar to battling where the cap is minus 200 off the gauge at the max and minus 50 at the minimum, but actually using it is easier because it procs every 256 steps walked. So the amount is taken off quite frequently even if the max is low, and you have to walk a lot in this game to get back to the PC to save and heal, so you can sometimes purify a significant amount off a of Pokemon's heart gauge without even really trying, of course depending on the length of the gauge. There are only two natures, bold and naughty, where the maximum is taken off per step, but there are also only two natures where the minimum is taken off, timid and quirky. Again, this is not really a main method you can rely on to purify a Pokemon unless it has a really low gauge and a good nature which is random and not something you have control over. I've had runs of this game where a majority of the Pokemon I caught were timid and quirky, and it has not been fun. There is an exploit where if you unplug and replug the controller while holding a direction on the stick, the character will continue walking forward, and in certain places the collision of walls and objects will cause the step counter to continue increasing, meaning you can essentially rubber band it and walk away. But do keep in mind that this is not how the developers intended you to be able to purify Shadow Pokemon when they designed these systems, and that they wanted you to use these methods normally instead. I'm looking at the logical conclusion of how these systems work together here. So even though it is possible to skip it by cheating, that's not really relevant to this conversation. The third method, Daycare, is a method you don't unlock until about a third of the way through the entire game when you reach Agate City. As mentioned before, the max it can take off is minus 600 for every 256 steps walked, and the minimum is minus 150. Before you get too excited about that number though, you can only purify one Pokemon at a time in the daycare, and they do not gain any levels while they're in there. Additionally, instead of the 100 Pokemon cost per level that's typical in the main series games, it seems that the amount increases significantly faster in this game, since Shadow Pokemon don't gain levels, which can get really steep for Pokemon with longer heart gauges. If that wasn't enough, there's also no way to know when a Pokemon is done being purified this way. There's no indication from the daycare lady how far along in the process they are, so it's really easy to waste money by keeping them in there longer than necessary. The only thing you can do is save, withdraw your Pokemon from the daycare, check the heart gauge, and then reset if it's not purified yet. You can get unlucky and get a Tyranitar, a Pokemon with the longest heart gauge in the game, with a relaxed nature, and just have this process cost a fortune. The fourth method is Sense another method that is not available until halfway through the game, when you can finally obtain the cologne case and buy scents from the Pokemart Nagate Village. This is a bit confusing because there are three different scents, each which decrease a Pokemon's heart gauge a different amount, and that vary in cost depending on effectiveness. If you thought this was a super repel situation, unfortunately no. The most effective scent is the same cost as two of the least effective scent, but it takes off three times as much, so you can basically forget the cheaper two exist and not waste your money. So basically the values on this chart from Bulbapedia or for the cheapest scent, so go ahead and multiply them by 3 and you'll get the true maximum each scent can take off, which is minus 600 for the natures where they're the most effective, and minus 150 for the natures where they're the least effective. Unfortunately, they are also ungodly expensive, at 1200%, and are single-use consumables. Even supposing you had a Pokemon with the shortest heart gauge that's mild-natured, it would still cost $6,000 to purify it using only scents. It also takes ages to use each scent. You have to to open your bag, go into your cologne case, select the scent, select yes for using the scent, select the Pokemon you want to use the scent on. Then there's a text box for using the scent. You have to wait something like 30 seconds 
and then you hear the Pokemons cry, and then there's two more dialogue boxes of text that the scent was used and how effective it was. And after you're done, you are now no longer in your menu, and you have to open it back up, go back into your bag, and do the entire thing over again. Even though these are the least effort to use, they are so cost prohibitive in terms of time and money that I basically only use these to lower the gauge two bars to see a Pokemon's nature and then reset the game so I don't have to buy more. So we've talked about the two minor methods that are not really main reliable ways that you can purify a Pokemon, but are really just kind of background things that help, and then the two very expensive methods that you only unlock later in the game. Which leaves us with the fifth and final method, the main way you'll be purifying a majority of the Pokemon in the game, calling out of hyper mode. Now believe it or not, there's only one nature in this whole stinking game where calling takes off 600 from the gauge. Docile and only one nature where it does the minimum, 150, sassy. For the rest, it takes off a reliable 400 to 225 points. And unbelievably, this is still the highest amount of points for any one method for most of the natures in the game. Due to the way this is balanced, and the fact that this method is available from the start of the game and is free, this makes it your best bet for purifying majority of the Pokemon you'll catch in the game, and is probably the reason no one has really ever tried or even knows anything about the other methods. Across the board, calling is your most reliable tool. The way this method works is first, the Pokemon must be out in battle. Second, the Pokemon must attack before they're knocked out. Third, the attack must be Shadow Rush. Then, there is an unknown percent chance that instead of attacking, the Pokemon will go into hyper mode. I have never been able to find the actual odds of this occurring because nobody knows anything about this game and nobody except me cares. Then finally, the Pokemon must survive the remainder of the turn in order to be called out of hyper mode the following turn, resulting in the reduction to the gauge. Pokemon do not go into hyper mode predictably, even if Shadow Rush is the only move you use. Sometimes a Pokemon will go into hyper mode seven turns in a row. Sometimes it will take three hours for it to happen once. In the case of my docile fucking Ledian, the thing couldn't live long enough for it to proc despite having it at the front of my party and doing nothing but battling for several hours. Looking at this chart, I don't get the sense that the variation in these methods was really meant to break up the gameplay, add depth, and encourage you to try different things on different Pokemon. I think basically it's designed to arbitrarily make some Pokemon just take longer to purify than others, and that some will ultimately just drain your wallet more. I think the reason this data is obscured by the game, by the fact that you can't even see the nature of the Pokemon you caught right away, or the length of a Pokemon's heart gauge at all, isn't an accident. It's to obfuscate this information so you don't figure out that the game is rigged against you and no matter what you'll end up grinding for something. It's a promise that at some point you'll need more money, more levels, or more coin flips to enter hyper mode. You'll never have enough money to cover healing items, ultra balls, and these costly purification methods without going out of your way to grind for it. You'll never have enough experience points to keep more than a single Pokemon up with the ridiculous level curve in this game, especially when Shadow Pokemon can't level up until purified and they're the majority of what you're using. And on top of that, half of the experience points a Shadow Pokemon earns before they're purified are entirely thrown out, guaranteeing that you will never earn enough experience to keep up even if you purified them all as fast as possible. Yeah, that's right, if you thought your Shadow Pokemon were leveling awfully slowly, you're correct, because they don't actually earn any experience at all until their heart gauge is half empty. And you'll never have enough battles to purify the massive amount of shadow Pokemon you get in this game if you only stay on the main track and never go back and redo any areas. No matter how efficient you are, and how much you try to learn the mechanics and optimize your playstyle, you will still need to grind at least two dozen Pokemon from full to empty after the credits roll and there is nothing left to do. There is no reward here for engaging with this system. You won't get a better result from trying to learn it and master it than you would if you just ignored it entirely and used calling out of hyper mode for every Pokemon. And if you didn't plan ahead at any point and accidentally raised the wrong Pokemon or spent your money on the wrong things or wasted a party slot on a Pokemon that would have been better purified in the daycare, it's incredibly punishing. And at the end of the day, instead of exploration or party building, the main gameplay loop of this game is just grinding. There's no substantive gameplay here that isn't grinding. It's literally all just a grind. If you had some way without data mining to reliably figure all this out, or if all natures had the same maximum and it was just distributed differently across different methods, 
or if natures weren't random and were the same for each Pokemon every time through the game, that would make some sense if this was designed to encourage you to really optimize and figure out what each Pokemon individually needs. But only a few of the natures have maximums high enough for it to even matter. So essentially, not only are almost all of the new mechanics that this game introduces to deal with the purification process redundant to the point of being something players never need to understand or engage with to purify Pokemon, they are also designed mostly to waste your time and make it take longer to purify your Pokemon in sneaky ways that you'd never be able to tell. I tend to lose people when I assume that developers maliciously decided to do something for anti-consumer purposes, but this is either blatantly anti-consumer, arbitrarily lengthening an otherwise pretty short story mode by putting the burden of filling out the game on the player, or it's complete incompetence that they accidentally settled on this set of mechanics that only makes the game completely unfun without adding any depth to the gameplay. And neither looks good. Personally, I I don't think this was an accident. It seems like if Nintendo's main goal for the aesthetics of this game was edginess, then their main goal for the mechanics of this game was artificial length without creating more content to fill the game out in the impossibly short development cycle this game had. It's almost like a joke game with anti-content, a game where all of the content is grinding. It's a very cynical set of systems that don't seem to care very much about providing gameplay that's actually enjoyable or engaging on any level. They're designed to drag all the length out of the game by making it as monotonous as possible kicking and screaming. If you look at the design choices through this lens, you start to see every little way they tweaked this game to milk a little more gameplay out of a very small world and very short story. Instead of saving anywhere, you can only save at PCs, and the PCs are placed in extremely inconvenient locations so that the player has to walk back through really, really long stretches of the game pretty frequently with a not very fast movement speed. There's this one PC in Pyrite Town that's at the very start of what's essentially a long dungeon that consists of a multi story building with over a dozen trainers to fight in the hallway, and on the roof of the building there's an entrance to a long cave system where there are even more trainers with multiple shadow Pokemon to catch. This PC is on the first floor, and there's an elevator from the roof that takes you to the ground floor but it will not take you back up to the roof. So every time you need to go back and save or heal, you have to walk all the way out of the cave, take the elevator from the roof to the ground floor, use the PC or the healing machine, and then walk back up through every flight of stairs in this building to get back to the roof just so that you can walk all the way back through the cave to where you left off. If you miss a shadow Pokemon in this area, or in any area, you have to come back and do the entire dungeon all over again to catch it later. And at this point, if you run out of items here and need to leave to go use a Pokemart, you're extremely screwed because if you leave this building at any point during this process, all of the trainers in the hallway in the cave reset and you have to battle them all, all over again. And this is true for nearly every location in the game. This thrilling chase down a staircase after Venus as she escapes becomes instead a clunky trip up and down these stairs eight times so you can go and save and put the new shadow Pokemon you catch here in your party, killing any sense of excitement or momentum the set piece might have had. Needing to make the game longer is why a lot of PC locations don't have any healing machine nearby at all, and instead you either have to pay money to rest at an inn, or deposit and withdraw every Pokemon in your party into the PC one at a time to restore them to full health for free. Colosseum is built to require grinding, but it gives you no wild encounters with which to do so, so instead every battle is a lengthy double trainer battle where there are four Pokemon on the field and a minimum of four moves and effects going off per turn, in an engine where you can't disable battle animations, compared to the possible one move that might be required to defeat a wild Pokemon. In Ruby and Sapphire, double battles are thematic and used to illustrate the theme of managing two sides of a conflict, but in this game they're the default mode of play simply because they take longer. It's pretty rare that a main series game asks you to stop and grind during the main gameplay, because you always have enough party options and ways to play around level disadvantages that if you don't meet the opponent in levels, you can make up for it in skill. But here, the end result of these systems is gameplay significantly more tedious than any other Pokemon game. Not only is there no mechanical depth added by Pokemon purification, and actively destroys any depth this gameplay could have had, and the biggest casualties are the party building and difficulty of the game. Using the pre-existing Pokemon mechanics and characters, they could have easily just imported the team building from the main series games and let those systems do the job they're supposed to do and allow for expressive self-constructed narratives and RPG gameplay. But instead, 
the purification system takes what is normally a very dynamic form of party building and reduces it to something needlessly static. Because you have to purify 48 Pokemon, and to do that they all need to be in your party basically the entire time in order to increase the chances that they'll be called out of hyper mode or to take advantage of walking, and throughout the game you're constantly catching more shadow Pokemon, you are essentially encouraged to only have unpurified shadow Pokemon in your party the entire game, along with probably one purified Pokemon to help you win enough of the battles to actually progress through the game. If you use purified Pokemon in these fights, if you try to build a team of six like a normal Pokemon game, you're wasting battles that you could be using purifying the others, and you'll have to grind on the same 10 guys over and over to make up for it later. But if you're only using unpurified shadow Pokemon, and if you're only using Shadow Rush in order to get them to go into hyper mode in order to purify them, then you aren't really using a variety of strategies and creative ways using the limited options that you have to work with. What you are using is Shadow Rush the entire game. It's not, oh fun, I get to try to make this Pokemon I've never used before work here. It's, I'm going to use the same move on every Pokemon Pokemon so that there's functionally no difference between any of them. Pick your shadow Pokemon with the highest base stats and that is essentially the best team building choice you have, since coverage isn't really an option. On top of using only shadow Pokemon for the majority of the game, you are only using a very limited selection of Pokemon, a majority of which are Pokemon that do not evolve and have very low base stats and shitty learn sets because of course they're all Johto Pokemon, because they need to be in order to fill back in the national decks in Ruby and Sapphire. Looking at what most of the late game Pokemon learn by leveling up, purifying them is an absolute downgrade. Shadow Rush the entire game gets monotonous, sure, but it's at least a decently powerful physical attack that does neutral damage to every type. If you purify a Pokemon, you lose Shadow Rush and will be rewarded with absolutely nothing worth using to replace it with. There are very limited TMs in the main part of this game. Only a few that you can earn by beating the Colosseums, which are mostly tactically defensive and not offensive. Some TMs you can buy in the under for your typical low accuracy special attacks, the same selection you'd find in the Lily Cove department store. And if you feel like grinding for Poke Coupons at Mount Battle for literally hours in order to earn four grand of them, you can trade them in for one of the TMs you'd find in the Mauville game corner. <sighs> oh yeah, I almost forgot to mention Mount Battle, which is an area of extremely tedious, uninteresting battles distinguished only from the rest of the game by the fact that they don't even bother coming up with a story to justify these. But anyway, that's it for TMs. No Earthquake, no Brick Break, no Focus Punch, nothing useful for a majority of the physical attackers you'll get in this game. Knowing only Shadow Rush and not being able to change the movesets is supposed to be a drawback tactically, but instead knowing whatever is normally in that move slot is always worse. Now not only is this really boring gameplay, it also clashes horribly with the whole point of Shadow Pokemon existing from an RPG standpoint. The the thematic justification for each nature having a unique method of purification, the entire reason presumably why you can't see the stats right away, is that in order to open up their heart and get them to stop being angry boys, you're supposed to be getting to know them as individual Pokemon, and through that care and the time you put into it, they're supposed to start being more themselves again and able to break free from this thing that's afflicting them. But functionally, Mechanically, the playstyle this incentivizes is actually to ignore everything about them as an individual Pokemon, spam one move the entire time they're in your party, and then discard them the second they're themselves again to get the next Pokemon in your PC's purification started. So instead of showing them kindness and getting to use a better Pokemon for your reward, you're rejecting them for no longer being fighting machines like a cold-hearted asshole. And in the tougher fights in the late game, you're basically totally dependent on Shadow Sneasel and Shadow Skarmory to stay in hyper mode as much as possible to land critical hits as often as possible in order to stand a chance against the boss rush at the end of the game where everyone has level 50 plus Pokemon and you still have level 30s and 40s. If the critical hits you get in hyper mode are supposed to be thematic, like the, the temptation of pursuing power ends up hurting people, unfortunately, mechanically, the drawbacks of hyper mode don't outweigh the necessity of abusing it towards the end of the game as an alternative to having to stop and grind everything up 20 levels. Shadow Pokemon will actually never disobey you in hyper mode as long as Shadow Rush is the only move you're using, so it's not a significant downgrade from them being out of hyper mode and is actually slightly more predictable because you'd rule out losing a turn coming in or out of it. Which begs the question, if there's no mechanical benefit to purifying Pokemon outside of being able to trade them to the GBA games, if you stick around long enough to get to the end credits, what actually is the main motivator that we have to keep playing if you're not not playing this game exclusively as a means to get a Suicune and Emerald version. If Shadow Pokemon existing actively unravels the themes of the game, 
and if purifying Pokemon isn't something that there's actually a built-in reward for that makes you want to do it, if in the story itself the protagonist doesn't even have a real defined motivation to want to do anything and accomplishes nothing, then what is the point of any of this? People say that not being able to team build, or the bad Pokemon, or the shitty move pools, or the lack of TMs, or the lack of experience, the overall lack of options is all an enjoyable way that the game increases the difficulty. Well, people are saying it, so let's talk about that for a second. A limited selection of Pokemon in itself isn't a bad thing. A challenging game is often a pretty appealing thing, and limiting the tools you have available to solve the problems in your way is one way to increase challenge. But limited resources are only a test of skill if you have the means to manage them, and your success or failure comes down to choices you can make. Here I have no meaningful choices. If nothing I can do changes the outcome of any fight, if I can't play my way out of these steep level jumps by using my brain, strategizing and coming up with a team combo or moveset that will help me in a specific situation for 90% of the game, and the only way around it is wasting hours of my life doing mount battle over and over, then I'd argue this is actually anti-strategy. This is grinding as the only means of overcoming. In mainline Pokemon games, team building is the main way you build strategies that can allow you to work around the level scaling and outplay the opponent at a disadvantage. But that is deliberately not something you can do in this game with Shadow Pokemon who can't grow and can't learn anything. You can't have massive level jumps and no team building options for it to be a meaningful test, it has to be one or the other. And if I can't play my way around this level curve because I have absolutely no options to work with, I can only grind to meet it. This is just asking you to turn your brain off, mash the A button until your number is bigger than their numbers, and then come back and plow everything down without thinking about it. And if that's the only type of difficulty this game offers, then the only test here is a test of patience, not skill. Sure, you can just catch and purify only a few shadow Pokemon, leave the rest to rot, and then level up a set team of six like a normal Pokemon game. And I'll be honest, that's probably the more fun way to play, just treating it like shadow Pokemon don't exist and pretending this is any other Pokemon game. In fact, I assume that this is what most people end up doing when they play this game. But if the game is the most fun when you ignore every single new mechanic it introduces, is that really a good thing? Is that the mark of a well-designed game? I'd argue no. Even if you do try to play through with a team of six purified Pokemon, you'll still need to stop and grind for levels and money and healing items. Because the level jumps throughout the game are so severe, and the experience you earn on the main track is basically only enough to keep one Pokemon up with the levels of what the enemy trainers are carrying. So if you want to increase the number of viable Pokemon in your party, you'll need to deliberately repeat the same few fights over and over to raise more. There's no playing around it, the game will get you to stop and grind for one reason or another. I can enjoy repetitive grindy gameplay, but only if it's to go out of my way to get something the game puts out of reach, or if the game justifies it with an expressive story building set of mechanics. Not if it's the only tool I have for engaging with the game at all. The only time any of these mechanics come together into something cohesive and actually engaging is in some of the boss fights of the game, and I would say really only for Dakim and Venus the first time you fight them. Because by the time you reach Ayn, if you've been using Espeon, you can pretty much one-hit KO all of his Pokémon. For these two or three fights, it actually does feel like you're piecing together a team out of what you have available, what you've purified so far, and gives you a chance to use Pokémon you otherwise might not to take on deliberately difficult challenges. In these fights, each of the bosses has a gimmick, like spamming Earthquake and Protect, or Attract, or using weather to their advantage, and there actually is a correct team of six Pokemon for each fight out of what you have available if you caught and purified everything in your path to that point that will provide the easiest win. Figuring out the perfect combination of how to overcome each strategy is actually satisfying, like a functional battle puzzle. If that were every fight in the game, or even just a majority of the fights in the game, I would actually agree with people when they say that the game is challenging in a meaningful way beyond just being balanced to encourage grinding to make the game longer. But it's rare that the fights in this game are actually difficult beyond just relying on unfair level jumps you have no hope of keeping up with and no team building options to play your way out of it with. And the majority, the vast majority of fights, even in areas that you would assume are designed to be actually challenging like the in-game coliseums, are just made up of overleveled, not fully evolved Pokemon. There is no thought put into these fights. No interesting ways to use double battles other than doubling up on damage and thus requiring twice the healing items. The majority of Pokemon you fight in this game across all the trainers are the same wild Pokemon you've run into over and over in Ruby and Sapphire, except sometimes they're level 70 while your Pokemon are still level 30. You may recall, on the Nintendo 64, there was Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2, which both provided post-game content for your main series Pokemon 
Pokemon games in the form of tough battling challenges, as well as many games and perks like additional storage and Pokemon organization. One of the reasons Stadium was so satisfying was it combined the RPG storytelling of the main series games using the same team building tools but applying them to new, fun, and difficult challenges. Not only were you taking down truly difficult opponents without overleveling even being an option because the cups were in a set range of levels, you were doing it with your party that you put together in your Game Boy games as part of your role-playing experience and continuing the story of your trainer. It begs the question, why is the game called Pokemon Coliseum? A Coliseum is just a bigger stadium, right? And there is stadium-esque content in this game, separate from the campaign, as well as a few perks for the main series games you can win, like TMs, held items, and berries. But Coliseum's battle modes are very short and not particularly challenging compared to Stadium. If you count like the two compelling boss fights in the story mode, there are maybe five fights in this entire game across both modes that are actually interesting, compared to the dozens in the Stadium games. And the hard fights in the battle mode are only hard because they use legendaries with ridiculously OP stats. There were legendaries in the Stadium games too, but they weren't used as a crutch the way they are here. There's just no thought put into any of this at all. It's not clever, it's not interesting. How is this functionally better than Stadium, where each fight is a well-planned challenge and you get to have fun strategizing or planning the perfect team to take them all on with? The only answer I can think of is that it gets more people to buy a GameCube if you say, oh, this one has a story mode like a real Pokemon game in the marketing. If the main problem with the Stadium games back in the day was that the rentals were a crappy alternative to raising your own Pokemon in the main games, but raising your own Pokemon to be ready at the level caps demanded of each cup in the game was too hard, then the selection of Shadow Pokemon in this game may have been thought up as a way to make the rentals slightly more flexible without making anything too overpowered for the challenge. Functionally, they're basically just rentals with static movesets and levels, and you still only get to pick from the selection of what you have available at the time. This was an opportunity to fix the rental issue, but instead it just replicates it. And all it really does is confuse to mix the stadium content with an adventure that has nothing to do with it. Because if you could do any sort of team building in this game, the main gameplay would require you to build mostly defensive sets geared towards surviving enough hits to catch Shadow Pokemon in each fight, rather than offensive sets that would be useful in Stadium Cups. It's really a worst of both worlds scenario. It's not satisfying Stadium content, nor is it interesting single player RPG gameplay. Everyone loses. And I think all this goes to show that nobody who worked on this game played any Pokemon games or really understood what people enjoy about them. This whole game is just busy work for the sake of tricking people into thinking that they're playing a real RPG and not the weak attempt to bait people into buying a GameCube it really is. And it's maddening to think that Nintendo most likely did all this intentionally, that they made the game worse on purpose just that it would be too long to rent while remaining as cheap as possible to develop. It's actually insulting that they thought Pokemon fans were shallow enough that we'd eat up this boring nothing burger slog of a game and that they'd move main series Pokemon game units. Because I think that more than anyone, Nintendo was probably the reason this game is an unfun mess, because nothing but cynicism was motivating its existence. The end result is that if you play it casually, you'll either play it only once, only long enough to get up to Mirror B and never touch it again, or if you do finish the game, you might have to grind once before the final boss rush and you probably won't have a ton of fun or anything, but you won't think it's so bad, and hey, at least the game is pretty. But the more you play this game like an actual RPG, the more you try to engage with the mechanics for their own sake, the more it punishes you and the less rewarding it is. The more content you try to complete, or heaven forbid if you want to actually purify all the Pokemon and trade them out, it evolves from mildly boring to actively torturous. It feels like a sellout move. We could have had an actually interesting set of battles like the stadium games that came before, or we could have had an actual Pokemon adventure with team building and real RPG mechanics. But instead, Nintendo wanted to say that they had a Pokemon RPG on their new console while putting in as little effort and money into it as possible. So they they bulldozed it all and replaced it with grinding the video game. So if you saw my last video, I bet you're piecing together why I super hate this game. Because they did all this in the name of everyone needing to spend over $500 on Nintendo consoles, games, and peripherals in order to complete the National Dex in Gen 3. Because I'll say it again, you can't trade any of these Johto Pokemon out of this game and into any other Pokemon game without putting in so much time to overcome all of this artificially and arbitrarily extended playtime and beat the game. So, who were the people who would have needed to play this game to completion? Who were the people who would have had any motivation to actually finish this shitty game? 
Nintendo cashed out big time on Pokemon right as they were losing their chance. So I know what a lot of you are already typing in the comments. What are you complaining about? XD Gala Darkness the sequel fixed like every single one of these problems. And you're right, pretty much exclusively by adding a passive way to purify shadow Pokemon with the purification chamber, so you don't need to run a rotating cast of shadow Pokemon through your party at all times, it solves pretty much every single one of these problems single-handedly. And if by solves you mean completely abandons every original mechanic Coliseum introduced and is pretty much just a regular Pokemon game but longer and more boring, I would agree with you. But what is XD Gale of Darkness's deal anyway? Why does it exist if Coliseum did not in fact sell more GameCubes for Nintendo? Which it didn't. The GameCube had even less market share than the Nintendo 64 did. It turns out you can't win a console war solely with one desperate looking and badly designed game. Well, probably because it was not the smash hit that Nintendo expected it to be, they were hoping to squeeze a little more money out of the project by developing a second game using mostly the same engine assets and systems. Not too much new stuff would have to be developed, so it could introduce another chunk of missing Johto Mons for the GameCube crowd, charge another $53, and call it a day. You'll notice that they gave up trying to appeal to potentially new older players or the kids who grew up with Gens 1 and 2, and were in their teens now and just dumbed everything down and brightened everything up for the existing Nintendo loyalists and GameCube user base, your 8 year olds and families. All the confusing mechanics and any mechanical depth whatsoever the first game might have had under all that arbitrary lengthening is gone. With no real attempts to salvage or rebalance it, it's just moved out of the way to the background so you don't even have to engage with it. No more interesting edgy premise, just a dweeby younger boy character and his annoying sister. There sure are a lot of characters that refer to themselves in third person in this game. XD is a much more enjoyable game to play because by ditching the purification system that requires you to only have shadow Pokemon in your party, it allows you to team build like an actual Pokemon game does. So most of what's good about XD can be pinned squarely on the strengths of the mechanics from the main series game, doing their job yet again. You can make a team. You don't have to use shadow Pokemon pretty much at all. You can roleplay and build an expressive narrative, and the game is still too long, but it's long legitimately this time and not entirely due to arbitrary lengthening mechanics. I would be more charitable with this game if it were possible to skip Coliseum entirely when we're playing Gen 3 for the national decks and opt to play XD instead. But rather than replacing the selection of shadow Pokemon in that game, it is instead an additional chore to complete all the way to the end in order to trade more Pokemon to your Hoenn games. And of course, it costs the same as Colosseum. So I am now paying twice as much money and needing to commit even more time to the endeavor in order to get everything that probably should have just been all accessible between fewer games and without any trade restrictions. So XD would probably have to be more than passable for me not to resent it. And unfortunately, my standards are impossibly high for what would justify its existence. I wasn't seething with anger playing it like I was with Colosseum, but I also wasn't exactly super invested in it for its own sake either. And if you would ask me at the time, in 2003, if I wanted to play it, I probably would have still said no, because you can't even play as a girl and I already had Pokemon games where you could. In a way, XD shows their hand. This is what Colosseum could always have been, without the purification mechanics that seem to exist solely to bloat the playtime and take hours of your life that you'll never get back. It's almost like an admission that they knew they were wasting your time. Instead of making a full game like XD that utilizes the Pokemon branded mechanics in a way that plays to the strengths of what they have to offer, they made the purification system and Coliseum. And XD ditching pretty much every single one of these mechanics is just a demonstration that even the developers did not believe there was ever any merit to them. Something designed out of a complete lack of respect for the time and money of your player base cannot be salvaged. I would say this could never happen again, but it very well could. Over these videos about the Gen 3 games, Ruby and Sapphire, Fire Red and Leaf Green, the Dexit video, and now here, We've spent a lot of time talking about Generation 3 and the beginning of this corporate era of Pokemon. Whether you agreed with me or didn't about the quality of these games, Coliseum is a product of trying to make a Pokemon game without the Pokemon and women who created it. An experiment that ultimately showed them that it couldn't be done easily by someone else without much input from Game Freak. But this was just the start of the story. And since Coliseum, there have been plenty of games made that you and I have liked. And we liked them not because Game Freak was the only one making decisions, but because all the people behind the scenes were making decisions together and everyone was united in the goal of making the best Pokemon games they could. Throughout Gen 3, there are examples of missteps and triumphs that only could have happened because of personal and business relationships that go back decades, where people who knew each other well got organized around this one video game success and on the same page about how to repeat it. I think that it would have been easy for Nintendo to hijack the franchise if they wanted to, and this gives us a little glimpse into that alternate timeline. They ultimately didn't do that because the people in 
charge all got along really well and worked really hard to make it all last. Pokemon is a franchise blessed with incredible luck that Colosseum wouldn't be the last game they made, or that Iwata became president of Nintendo and not someone else, or that Masuda stepped up into the role of game director for nearly 15 years and then producer for another 7, or that Ishihara, who turned 65 this year, believed in all the people who made something special he couldn't have expected. But Colosseum should be a reminder that it can all go away just as quickly. Masuda is left Game Freak, Iwata is gone, and in his place is someone whose relationship to Pokemon is that it was a stepping stone to his current career. Ishihara is lucky to have stayed on long enough to see a second Pokemania thanks to Pokemon Go, but it still hasn't subsided with the release of the now second best-selling Pokemon game since Gold and Silver, but what will he do when this wave ends for him? Game Freak left Carrot Tower and has moved into a Nintendo building. Star talent at the company, like James Turner, one of the former Genius Sonority developers who was absorbed into Game Freak after XD, and also the art director for Sword and Shield, has left for other opportunities. And Pokemon games are now incredibly outsourced compared to just a few years ago with Sun and Moon. We're going to be in a new era sooner than you might think, and it might be similar to Generation 3 where things look rough. A lot of people look back on Colosseum today and make comparisons to the Pokemon games on the Switch. Why can't these games be more like the first console game? I've heard it time and again. Well, you might get another game like Colosseum in the future. A game designed by people who have never played a Pokemon game before. Be careful what you wish for.